or generative and discriminative learning. Everything that we saw in the class so far involves a fixed unknown distribution. Uh, there's a hidden function that takes x to y, uh, the instant space, to the label space. Mm -hmm. The label space is uh, minus one or one. Um, it's the same as, so it, this is uh, uh, similar to assuming that there's a fixed unknown distribution over x and a fixed function. So the standard uh, procedure that we saw for learning was you're given a data set and you want to identify some hypothesis space and you want to minimize some loss function. There's some regularization either explicitly with a regularizer or implicitly with something like dropout. And the usual sort of guarantee is uh, if we find an algorithm that minimizes loss, then learning theory with all the caveats that I just said, learning theory guarantees good future behavior. These classes of models that we've trained are actually called discriminative models. These are models that learn how to make predictions. You look at many like, positive and negative examples, you discover regularities in the prediction process and try to construct a policy or a function that can make predictions. Um, one way or another, we are estimating this conditional probability probability of y given x. Given the input x, what is the distribution over the label for a new example? All the models that we saw are doing, uh, are, um, uh, try to, uh, are doing this. A completely different class of models is something called a generative model. And here, I'm using the word generative in a standard uh, traditional machine learning sense. Lately, the word generative has come to take on a different meaning because of generative AI. This is not that. And now, uh, maybe some of you are wishing you hadn't raised your hands. Mm -hmm. But the a generative model is one that explicitly models not just, does not model the process in which the labels are created, assigned to examples. Instead, it models the process in which examples are created, P of X, and also the process, or sorry, it models the joint distribution P of X comma Y. In con uh, just to uh, put this in contrast, a discriminative model models P of Y given X. This is the probability distribution that any discriminative model tries to characterize. A generative model tries to char characterize the joint distribution of X and Y. But P of X comma Y is nothing but P of Y times P of X given Y. So typically generative models are set up that way. Probability of the label, you learn two different models. You learn a model that predicts the probability of the label. This is just it's like a prior probability. Without having seen any example, what might the label probability, what, what label uh, is likely or what's the probability over the label space. And the second term there, P of X given Y, is simply asking, if I have a label, say spam, construct an email that looks like a spam email. If I have, so that P of Y, X given Y, X is things like emails or images. Imagine I have a cat detector, a generative model for a class cat detector. So the, let's say the label space is, uh, is this image a cat or not a cat? And the instant space is of course the image, the collection of pixels. A discriminative model just builds a cat detector. Given an image, find a cat, whether it's a cat or not. A generative model would learn two different distributions. What is the probability that an image has a cat in it? An image, any image, without actually having seen the image. What, what's the probability that images have cats in them? That's P of Y. P of X given Y is asking, if I tell you that this image has a cat, can you construct that image for me? Can you construct an image P of X given the label that this has a cat? So given these two distributions, you can combine them together and you can get P of X given Y. Now, once you have, sorry, P of X comma Y, once you have P of X comma Y, the joint, that's called the joint distribution. Now you can do whatever you want with it. You can, for example, given a new image, you can ask what's the probability that the image has a cat by saying, 
This is nothing but P of Y, comma X divided by P of X. And now your model knows how to, how to calculate that directly. So you just calculate those two probabilities and pick the one that has the higher one. You can predict P of Y given X using base rule. The big difference here is generative models characterize both inputs, X, and outputs, Y. Discriminative models explicitly characterize only the decision boundary. So let me show you an example of the that of this difference. Generative models use the model parameters to represent a joint distribution to represent uh, p of x comma y. So the capacity of the model, all the parameters that are going into the model, are used for both these things, x and y. The classic example of a generative model is a naive Bayes classifier. Another famous example is a hidden Markov model. We've covered neither of these, but these are just names we use. Discriminative models learn P of Y given X, and they only characterize the decision model. Everything that we saw in class this semester is a discriminative model. So imagine that you have this classification model where there are red circles. Yes. Um, it's like the value of like predicting these like different probabilities. Uh, so like, like well, like, not so. quite. So let me show you. Let's, let's work through this example and you can come back to this question. So let's say we have this classification task, red circles and blue circles. And notice that the, the, let's say this is the natural, this is actually from the natural distribution of the data. There's some cluster of red things here, another cluster here, and a line of red things here. There's a cluster of blue here, some blue here, and a line of blue things here. What a discriminative model would do is, or let's start with what a generative model does. A generative model characterizes how the input, how the entire data and the labels are generated. It has to, a, a generative model has to use the parameters of the model to discover these clusterings of data and the fact that some of, on one side you have blue and one side you have red. So it has to discover these clusters all this underlying structure in the data, plus the fact that this side is blue, this side is red, and that side is blue. On the other hand, the discriminative model does not really care that the red circles and the blue circles have these sort of uh, clusters. It only needs to characterize the decision model. All the effort, all the capacity of the model is used only to describe that line there. Whereas the generative model has to describe all of these pieces. You want to ask your question now? Yeah. I, Go ahead. So like I like what is like the point? What is the point? Ah, good. Okay, good. So what's the point? Uh, the fact that you're asking that question means that I've done, I've done a good job of convincing you that the only thing that matters is that it's from to one. There are certain classes of tasks where you don't really care only about the decision boundary, but also about the underlying structure of the data itself. For instance, maybe you want to generate some data example, data points. Generative models tend to be especially helpful when you want to when you want to do things like uh, unsupervised learning. When you are trying to construct such clustering, the k-means algorithm actually can be seen as coming from a generative uh, model. The generative, generative model can be helpful when, imagine that you, you have only a few labeled examples and a whole bunch of unlabeled examples. Maybe in these red circles, um, you know, let's say this point is labeled, this point is labeled, this in the blue circles, these two points and this one is labeled. Only the highlighted points are labeled. But you also have a whole bunch of unlabeled data points. So if you had a generative model, it could discover these clusters and it kind of bleeds the labels into the neighboring clusters. So you might be able to get more out of the data with the generative model and in a mathematically sound way. So generative models can do those, those sorts of things. Generative models, for example, can also be used to do other things. Namely, you might be able to generate data from the model. And that could be useful for other things. Uh, you might be able to do 
Um, for example, you might be able to construct uh, things like topic models. Topic models are generated models. You don't want to generate data from a topic model because it's going to be lousy, but you could do that. Um, the, the, a famous uh, uh, learning algorithm called expectation maximization assumes that what you have is a generative model. We are not covering EM uh, because we are only now looking at generative models, uh, but there's like a whole side of machine learning that builds on top of that. The generative model tries to characterize the distribution of the inputs. The discriminative model just doesn't care. And the, the point here is, if the only thing you need your machine learning system to do is to predict labels for your inputs, then of course a discriminative model is absolutely the right thing to have. Because you're using all the capacity of the model to do exactly what you want. But if you want your, uh, your the parameters to do other things, maybe, on one example, only a part of the features are visible, and you want to construct the rest of the features. If you had a generative model, you might be able to discover the rest of the features because you have the full joint distribution. And you can, uh, you, it works more naturally with partial data, partially, partially labeled examples or even partially visible examples. Okay, um, I'll stop here. Um, in the next lecture, which is the last lecture, we'll look at uh, some big picture questions involving machine learning and see if we can recap the entire semester. Don't forget your homework and all those other things. <laughs>